Hi guys, welcome back to another week of Art Life. You may notice that we are one painting down in the studio, and that is because I have delivered it to the Royal Academy because it was shortlisted for the Summer Exhibition 2022. It was called Whimsy. Um, so let me talk you through the process of yesterday with you in London. I started off by wrapping up the painting within an inch of its life and I made my way on the train, literally making sure nobody nudged me, nobody kind of touched me because I was convinced that this painting was going to suddenly get kind of crushed on the tube, which it didn't. I got to the Royal Academy and it is a beautiful building, like near Green Park, so it's in the heart of like the West End and I kind of was like really excited to check out the exhibitions there, which I did later and I'll talk you through that a little bit after. But they kind of directed me to the underbelly of the gallery. They were really sweet, they ushered us all in, these artists in like single file with all our different sized paintings uh, to this kind of docking area, unwrapped the painting. I had a lot of wrapping paper so like two of us had to kind of like slowly demummify this painting and then they just took it off and it was like oh okay uh, I'll just go then. So um, there was lots of like congratulations, lots of people taking photos. Um, I was like oh got a bit of time so I thought I'd go to the exhibition that was on at the moment. Coincidentally it was Whistler and he is one of my favourite painters so I actually also managed to sneak in a little trip to the recent exhibition of Whistler's Woman in White, an exploration of the artist's muse and painting. So I want to talk you through a little bit about that exhibition and how I found it and how I'm going to use the inspiration from that trip in my painting today. So Whistler, or James McNeil Whistler, he was active between, well not active, he was born in 1834 and died in 1903. He is well known for being part of the American Gilded Age of painting. Um, I think he started off in the army and then decided to leave the army and go to Paris to pursue a bohemian lifestyle, which is something I always respected about him. Um, he is very famous for his kind of painting of the artist's portrait of the artist's mother, that's where you may have heard about him before, this very iconic painting of his mum. He was famous because he was an articulate theorist about art itself and had a huge impact for England when he brought French painting to the kind of forefront of the art scene in the UK at the time. Uh, this is kind of highlighted with his relationship with Courbet, uh, who in this exhibition Whistler's Woman in White was also showcased next to the artist. This is the great thing about the RA, they didn't just include a bunch of paintings, they included documents and sketchbooks and paintings of his kind of contemporaries who were influenced by the same things. So it felt like stepping into the world of Whistler and kind of his mind, which is kind of why I feel so influenced by it today. It kind of, it really captivated this sense of kind of journeying into the artist's psyche, which is always the best thing about an exhibition. So particularly looking when so Whistler arrived in Paris in 1855, was a success in Paris, was kind of like, he influenced very much the kind of impressionists of the time, like Degas was known to kind of like want to sketch from some of his works, he influenced the pre-Raphaelite period in the UK, shortly after releasing some of the paintings I'm going to talk about now. He was kind of avant-garde at the time. Actually, interestingly, the Royal Academy rejected a lot of these paintings that we're going to talk about when he first brought them over to England, which is mad because you'd never think that the Royal Academy would reject something which we associate as very kind of traditional and like figurative, but no, in the Victorian era, like Worcester's scale of his works, they were big, they were like what had only been used for a grand scale, it would it would have been kind of regal portraits, very grand portraits, not loose impressionist style, almost life-size portraits. And the fact that these portraits were so big yet so simple, the Victorians couldn't cope. Their minds exploded and they just couldn't take it. So that was a thought I thought a really interesting thing I didn't know about kind of Whistler's work. I always just thought, oh yeah, he was always just universally loved. He was very avant-garde for his time. So this exhibition in particular explored the relationship of the artist and the muse. So the woman in white was actually Joanna Hifferman, who was an Irish, I think she was from Limerick, model, confidant, lover, friend, also eventually a kind of a power of attorney for Whistler's estate. They became so close and in, kind of entwined in each other's lives. At one point, I think, Whistler went off and had an affair and a secret love child and the son he had out of wedlock was then raised by like 
Joanna and her sister Agnes. So these these guys were close. They were helpful to each other in their lives. It, this is the exploration of the relationship of the artist news in a way which often history doesn't explore. Not just saying, okay, this beautiful woman inspired the artist, he painted this amazing picture and everybody loves it and the artist. She was an actual woman, a woman behind the paint. And that's what I found so interesting about this exhibition. It really brought her to life and also, the different ways he painted her reflects different stories, different narratives. Often the, Victorias, the Victorians really loved a narrative with painting and sometimes Whistler didn't give it to them. He would just paint kind of Joanna in the most beautiful setting, you know, the symphony in white and a beautiful white gown. She's simple, she's kind of very calm and passive in the painting, which obviously at the time nobody knew how to deal with, but now we can look on it and see serenity and a, a looseness and freedom of movement and gesture with paint. Whistler was very influenced also by Japanese antiquity. So he loved the gestures of calligraphy in Japanese art and applied that, which I think he called, wait, let me get the word right. He called it painting source. So he was using these kind of loose movements of applying paint in the same way calligraphy almost was applied fast with freedom and expression. So his painting source, you really see evidence of that in some of his gestures. It's confident and it's kind of underlined by a sense of a sort of joyful love of the medium. So in this exhibition, there was also, you could see the influences of Klimt, Klimt's uh, portrait of Hermine Gallia in 1904. When you look at it next to the symphony in white, you see the direct kind of influence. And that's what really kind of made me take attention. It's that the artists that we now associate with kind of art history, the greats, the masters, they were real people being inspired by their contemporaries and what had kind of gone before. And I think that's what I need more of in my kind of art history practice, going to exhibitions, but feeling like I could get to know the artist on a more intimate level. So what was helpful is the uh, RA included letters that the artist wrote to his friends, like Courbet wrote a letter to, um, Whistler about a day at the beach that they spent at the beach and how um, Hifferman had entertained them in the evening and so she was the model and also Courbet painted her which I thought was quite interesting how they were using the same model in the same exhibition but very different interpretations by the artist. One of my favourite pieces in the show wasn't actually the paintings which blew my mind and it might be because they blew my mind I almost couldn't take them in I was like how is that achieved in paint? Whistler also did dry point work. There was one study called Weary, which just felt so delicate and so encapsulating of a mood and how Joanna just felt really accessible and I could really identify with that sort of expression and emotion captured in dry point. And I, I was kind of stood in front of that tiny little study for the longest, which I wasn't expecting to. I thought I'd just only be looking at the big famous snazzy paintings, but no, it was all the kind of smaller studies, the sketchbooks, the pocket notebooks, which I found so interesting. I think the story of where in London, Joanna and Whistler met took me by surprise because she had no money. She'd come from a poor Irish family that immigrated to London. Um, and then when they met, they started over winter, Whistler started sort of sketching Joanna in a painting called Wapping, which was done on the boats by the pier. The painting was included in the exhibition and she must have been freezing. But at the beginning, he started to paint her as a prostitute. And as their relationship deepened over the winter, he started to make her more and more respectable, adding more clothes, making her expression much more demure until the final exhibition until the final painting was revealed, it was hung in the Royal Academy. She looks very kind of dark, very kind of part of the landscape, but very respectable and almost kind of beautiful, but in a subtle, almost mysterious way, which encapsulates, I think, the beginning of a great relationship between the artist and the muse. You could see as he got to know her more, he wanted a painter in a way which reflected who she was to him. So that's just a kind of overview of how the exhibition influenced me. He called these paintings arrangements, harmonies, nocturnes. I think the way that Whistler kind of talked about his works and how he encapsulated that sense of different journeys and different relationships he had with the mediums has just fired me up, which is exactly what I needed because my exhibition is next month and I've got a lot of painting to do. And I thought actually a lot of his paintings were done with no blacks. They were light and fresh and confident in their palettes. So I thought, why not take the palette and tonal colors of one of my favorite Whistler paintings 
figure out all the right paint colours and then why not make one of my paintings using the same colours? Just as an experiment after Whistler to see if maybe studying his colours and his palettes might inspire me like he's inspired so many artists in history just to make something I can exhibit myself in my show next month. Okay, so this is Whistler's Crepuscule in flesh tones and green. Um, it's always been one of my favourite kind of subtle seascape landscapes. I love the kind of muted tones he uses, nothing too dark, but that green is very similar to some of the greens I've been using for my recent kind of landscapes, my abstract vista studies for my exhibition. Um, so what I found, because I'm in love with this kind of procreate everything to do with this new iPad. Um, you can actually dissect the palettes of something technically, so it will break down all of the nuance of colour, um, which, I mean, I'm gonna do it by eye, but it's so helpful to just kind of break down the colours of the image, techni like technologically, to kind of see what colours I should be using when I'm making this. Uh, and I was kind of imagining it would be dominantly green and blue, when actually it's mostly shades of purple and grey. So things you don't know sometimes that a computer picks up which your eye can't and I think that's also something very interesting about colour that a kind of example like this an experiment when you're breaking down the colour palette of a painting you love and using the tones to create your own piece you learn something new about colour and tonal qualities I mean Whistler himself called called a lot of his works tonal symphonies um, and in his nocturne work as well he described them as kind of in a chromatic way, um, which I just think gives you a lovely insight into the artist's mind. How I'm gonna do this is basically like this. If any of you have seen earlier episodes I've done of my more sketchbook studies with landscapes, I break down the color palette of the colors I want to use for the painting. I also write down exactly the Michael Harding oil colors I use and how I blend them to make sure I get the exact right recipe. Um, so if I ever want to return to the study, I'll know where to look on my paints because sometimes you spend so much time trying to get the right shade and it's so much easier if you just write it all down. So I will be detailing exactly the colours I'll be using just so I can make sure that I don't kind of, what's the word, go off piece too much, which which I definitely want to do. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just get started. Van Dyke Brown. Isn't that lovely? It's like dark chocolate.
Okay, so it's actually really hard trying to create from the palette of Whistler a kind of soft, smoky atmosphere piece because without the definition of maybe the more structuralized kind of landscape of the time, it does get a little bit kind of hazy and it's like I need to kind of pull back the paint a bit. It's very easy to overly smash paint onto the paper so I might work into this a little bit after it's dry and just add some more definition but I like how it feels very spring-like, very smoky, very gentle and it's a relief to get away from maybe the other colours I've been using at the moment which are a lot more intense, a lot more high pigment, uh, lots of pinks and turquoises so it's nice to just tone it back for an afternoon. Um, so yeah, I hope you've enjoyed watching me just have a play with the with Whistler palette and that you will join me every Monday for more Art Life episodes. You can follow me in the week at Jess Oliver Art on Instagram if a week is too long to go between watching these Art Life videos. Um, you can also catch me on my website, jessoliver.co.uk, where I kind of keep a regular portfolio of the paintings I'm doing at the moment, all leading up to my exhibition Vista next month in Suffolk. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Please leave a comment below. I love to hear your feedback. It inspires me to keep making these videos. And do like and subscribe if you haven't already. We are still building this channel. Um, so all the help you can give us would be greatly appreciated. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna carry on with this. I will see you next week. Bye guys.